Um, so I'm, I'm Hillel Fold. Um, how do I define myself as a professional noise maker? Um, I know many people are, are, when it comes to social media and, and marketing in general, are very um, focused on numbers. So just to give you context, um, Twitter, 25,000 followers. Facebook, tens of thousands. I haven't checked. And you know, Google Plus, 50,000 followers. And millions of readers of blogs. I write on Mashable and Gigome and Business Insider and Huffington Post. And like I said, a professional noisemaker. Um, so just a little context. Uh, three years ago, pretty much to the day, um, a company in, in Petah Tikva asked me to join them as head of marketing. And uh, the CEO sat me down the first day of my job and he said, we have to reach 10,000 developers in 2011. How are you going to do that? And I said to him, he expected me to say, you know, SEO, PPC, and traditional advertising, and customer acquisition, and blah, 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 blah. And I said, uh, I'm going to start a blog for the company. He said, what now? And I said, I'm going to start a blog for the, blog for the company, and I'm, on this blog, I'm never going to talk about the company. That was my first day at work, and it was almost my last day at work. He always kicked me out of his office right away. He had no idea what I wanted from him. And I said to him, listen, it's very simple. You can talk about yourself, self-promote from today to tomorrow. Everyone does it. It's very easy to do. There's no challenge. Um, or you can do something with a little bit of thinking out of the box. And let's, he's alone. let's see how this works. And he said, okay. Now, that wasn't an easy okay for him, you know, to pay someone a salary and not see ROI, right? Return on investment. In other words, if I'm not writing about the company, and what the hell does he care how much traffic this blog gets if we're not talking about ourselves? But he went, he went with it. Um, and so day in, day out, I would write this company blog. Um, I think four months later to the day, uh, the blog was quoted on CNN Money as an authority in mobile advertising. That was the day that he got it. Uh, so this, this presentation that I'm giving is, is really, uh, I called it how to market yourself in the web in two words. Now I'm asking you guys for a favor. At the end of my speech, please remind me to tell you what those two words are. Because I get very into it and I forget to actually talk about the point of my whole speech. I'm, you'll, you'll probably be able to guess what those two words are, but I'd like to tell you what, what my opinion are, is about those two words. So remind me at the end, what are the two words? But uh, reality is as follows. Uh, in today's world, push marketing, whether it's a banner on the, on the highway or a, an ad in the New York Times, or a blog that talks about yourself all day long, just doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's old ineffective and it's, it's worse, it's annoying. And not only are you not going to get traffic to this blog because no one's going to click on a link that says check out our thing because it's so amazing, you're going to do damage to your brand. Uh, how many people here in the, in the crowd, I just want some context for myself, have a blog? Wow, seriously. How many people have Twitter? How many people here are entrepreneurs? Everyone pretty much. How many investors? entrepreneurs, one investor, two investors, okay, all right. And I, I'd say maybe a third of everybody that raised their hand when I asked who's an entrepreneur said they have Twitter and a blog, which is a serious problem, and I hope at the end of this, this talk it's gonna increase substantially, it's my goal. Um, anybody hear anybody of the name Gary Vaynerchuk? Raise your hand, anybody heard that name? Nice. All right, so Gary Vaynerchuk um, is a Jewish guy who, who came to the States from Russia at a very young age. And he uh, tells the story that he was, he was born an entrepreneur. From birth, he had entrepreneurs were running through his blood. What does that mean? It means that he would go into his neighbor's backyard, pick a flower, knock on their door and sell it to them. Okay? He would drive around on his big wheels, I don't know if you guys remember the big wheels, little, and, and uh, sell baseball cards, and you know, he had a newspaper uh, delivery service. He was a little kid, right? He, he really was a born entrepreneur. And his dad opened up a wine store in New Jersey called Wine Library. Now, Gary watched his father go into work every day. He didn't have the culture. He didn't have the connections. There was really no way he was going to make it in this business, right? He had tons of competition, as always. You know, coming to a, a, a you know a crowded market, and so he watched his father do this every day, coming back, not making money, not succeeding. And he said to himself, "There has to be a better way." And he said, "I'm an I'm an energetic guy. I'm a charismatic guy. Let's try something." He took Wine Library, which was the name of this wine store in New Jersey. He put it on YouTube. He called it Wine Library TV. Within four years, he took a $4 million local business to $40 and $50 million revenue on YouTube. He was the first person to monetize social media, right? The big question about social media, you know, let me, let me take a break here. The word social media, can we not use it anymore? Because 
I fundamentally oppose that phrase. If you think about it for two seconds and step away from the buzz that everybody uses that word, social media, and think about that phrase, really think about it. The word social, by definition, means two-way, right? You're interacting. What does media traditionally mean? Broadcast, one way. So social media is an, is an inherent paradox. It's, it's a flawed phrase and we should stop using it. And that's why I, I was offended when they called me a mumche for social media. Just, there's no such thing. If you know how to be a, per, a, pure, a human being, you know how to treat other people, then you're a mumche in social media. So anyway, Gary Vaynerchuk uh, was the first to monetize social media. And after he was able to bring that, that business and scale it to $40 to $50 million revenue like that, um, all the big brands wanted a piece of the action, right? Nobody knew how to monetize this thing. Everybody who had a tweet, everybody who had a blog, how do you monetize it, right? What's the ROI? And so, you know, big brands were, were calling him in to, to pitch and explain to them why they should hire him. And he tells the story that uh, he, he was at Pepsi one day. And on that day, there was a new uh, VP. And she said to him, the famous question, what is the ROI of social media? I'm a VP of Pepsi. I need to sell Pepsi. More Pepsi than Coke sells. I need to sell drinks. Why should I hire you? Part of my friends bullshit on Twitter all day long. If I could take the money that I have for marketing and put an ad in the New York Times or a billboard on the, on the road or anything else and, and acquire customers, why should I hire you to just talk on, on Twitter and engage with people, right? Everyone loves that word, engage. Why should I hire you? So he said, all right, you know, he, he thought to himself, this is the VP of Pepsi, I'll, I'll take out the graphs. He took out graphs, started showing her brand awareness, you know, brand loyalty, and all the, the, again, buzzwords that everyone uses. And she said, come on. Who are we kidding here? I need to sell drinks. Don't give me brand awareness, BS. How am I gonna sell drinks? Again, he started taking, sure, he wanted to talk to her in her language, but they weren't communicating. So he took a step back, he took a deep breath, and he said to himself, all right, he's a room full of Pepsi executives, right? And she's asking this question, it's clear to him that he has around 30 seconds or he's out of there. So he looks her in the eye, he says to her, what's the ROI of your mom? It was a little awkward. <laughs> He said, let me, let me explain what I mean. He says, this is not a mother joke. I'm not making a mother joke, relax. He said, when you're growing up and your mother tells you you're beautiful, right? Or when you scrape your knee in school and your mom says, don't worry, we'll be okay. Or when you lose a baseball game and your mom says to you, you'll win next time. He says, can you quantify the value of that statement? Can you say that when I was six years old, my mom told me that my 80s haircut was beautiful. So when I was 17, I founded my first company and then sold it when I was 21, and I made my first million when I was 25. Can you make that connection? Clearly not. You can't do that. But anybody with a half a brain and understanding of human psychology, basic, you don't have to be a psychologist, but any, anybody in this room understands that when your mother told you you're beautiful as a kid, it built your self-esteem, it built your identity, it built who you are. And he says everything he's done in life is because his mother told him he was beautiful when he was a kid. Honestly, that is the ROI. It's much, you can, can't quantify it, but because you can't quantify it, that doesn't mean it's not valuable. He says, when you're on Twitter and you're engaging, right? Not selling. Let me just be very clear here. Not selling, but you're engaging. That means somebody who's not even your target audience. Maybe he is. One day, maybe he will be. Maybe he isn't. Maybe he is. Doesn't even matter. He asks, what color shirt should I wake up? Should I wear today? And you answer blue. That is good social media. That is good marketing. How is that good marketing? Because you're raising the awareness of your brand. Another story with Gary Vaynerchuk that I think hit home for me is that when he made his first big wine sale. Someone came into the store and bought, I think it was $10,000 of wine, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. Um, you know, he sold it, it was a big success, it was a happy day in the Vayner Chuck household. Uh, he could have said, thank you very much, like most of us would do, you know, and go, I don't know, go out to eat steak or something. What did he do? He opened up this guy's Twitter account, okay? He followed this guy on Twitter for two weeks. He, followed, he stalked him. He learned everything there is to learn about this guy. And he found out that this guy is a super, super, super fan of some quarterback. I don't know, I don't know anything about sports. Some quarterback. Big fan of this quarterback. He talks about him all day long. What did Gary Vaynerchuk do? He went and he opened up eBay.com, I believe. He ordered the jersey of that quarterback signed by the quarterback. Cost him whatever it cost him, probably 80 bucks an hour. He sent it to the guy. The guy sent him a response saying, I will never buy wine from another company for the rest of my life. <laughs> Ever. Now that, right there, that cannot be achieved with a billboard at all. If you're driving on the highway, he, he actually says, you know, it's, it's absurd if you think about it, that companies today are paying for billboards. Do you understand how you measure the effectiveness of a billboard? Have, have you guys ever seen a guy stand there with a clicker? Like, really? In 2014, this is what we're doing? He says, not only are people not looking at billboards, 
People are looking at the road. They're on their phones. And you're buying billboards? Come on. And these are big, respectable companies. This is what we're doing? Gary Vaynerchuk coined the term. It's not really a term, but he coined it as a term. Value. Provide value. Yes, you have to measure. Yes, marketing involves measuring and quantifying. I'm not, you know, no, anybody who doesn't believe that fundamentally doesn't understand marketing. You need to measure. And if you're not, you know, increasing your awareness in whatever metric that you want to use, whether it's Twitter mentions, whatever you want to use, then, then there is something wrong. You need to measure. But can it all be measured? Absolutely not. Two years ago, I'm sitting at work, minding my own business, and I get a tweet to the company Twitter account in caps lock. You know what caps lock means on the internet, right? This guy's pissed off, right? He says, has anybody ever used your product? Publicly, this is on Twitter, everyone sees it. So I wrote him back in real time on Twitter with the, the company Twitter again, and I said, sure, what seems to be the problem? He said, I've been trying to integrate your SDK for three months, and I can't get it to work. This is all public. So I'm shaking, right? So I wrote back to him again publicly. Would love to hear the information of what's going on here. This is my, this is my, my email account. Personal, you know, company email account, publicly. I sent it to him, this is my email account. Three seconds later, I get an email in my inbox detailed explanation of what's going on and be way beyond my scope. I'm not a technical, you know, I'm not a coder. It was, you know, I brought the, the technical team next to me so we could, I wrote him back an email within 10, 15 minutes. It, was, it happened to have been a very simple solution. He wrote me back. We had a ping pong match of 10, 15 minutes back and forth by email. 15 minutes later, the guy opens up his Twitter account with 50,000 followers and writes the following message. Dear, name of the company, you are my hero. <laughs> now, let's just step back and analyze what just happened here. I didn't take someone who's, you know, never heard of my brand or who doesn't have any emotion or any feeling towards my brand and converted him, which is what a, a billboard will do. I took someone who hates my brand and is angry at me, and within 10 minutes and zero budget, I turned him into not a user, but an ambassador. Someone with an emotional connection to my brand. Not only is he a customer, but he's doing my work for 10 minutes by answering him and listening. That's it, that's all I did. Twitter. Is one example, but this whole world of social, call it whatever you want to call it, it's a, it's a listening medium, it's a listening platform. There has never been a platform this powerful to just hear what's going on in the market, whether it's your competitors, whether it's what the market's saying, where the trends are going. You know, companies have pivoted based on things that just hear what's going on in the market, right? These things are absolutely listening platforms. A few years ago, um, a company, you know, as a blogger, I get a lot of press releases every day. And this is, this is the same story, right? I'm sure many of you, many people here have done PR. And I'm sure many of you can't afford a PR agency, so you're writing your own press releases. And unfortunately, as a blogger, I see this 300 times a day. Dear blogger, in many instances, the emails of me and 400 other bloggers are in the two field. Yeah, at that point, I just hit my head against the desk and I'm ready to give up on humanity, but it's another story. Uh, dear blogger, we released this product. We would love if you write that. Delete. 200 times a day. I get a press release a few years ago, I don't remember, two or three years ago. Dear Hillel, we follow you on Twitter. We love this post that you wrote, we really enjoyed it. We have a platform for Twitter. The name of our platform is Twitterland. Anybody hear from them? Yes. We confirm the story with them then, later. Uh, we would love it if you check out our platform. At that point, when I read that press release, I said, I don't even care what they're doing, I ain't writing about these guys, because this press release is how it's done. This is how you do marketing. Personalized, caring relationships. So I checked it out, and I happened to have loved the platform, and I wrote, I wrote an article about it. I tweeted that article. Alyssa Milano, over here, her? who's the boss? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Charmed. She has a few, I think two and a half, three million followers on Twitter, and little, little did I know, she's a tremendous geek, very into technology. Now, she retweeted that tweet. That was cool. Some Arab guy in Saudi Arabia with 50 million followers retweeted her tweet. Their servers, in Tel Aviv, didn't just crash, melted. Melted from one tweet. Now they have millions and millions of users, and when they speak publicly, and I'm humbled by it, I absolutely do not take credit for it, but they spoke at South by Southwest, and they showed a big picture of their launch strategy, which was like a picture of my face the size of I don't even know what. Which is funny, in reality, it had nothing to do with me, it had to do with the fact that this is the power of Twitter. When my daughter was born, I got a package this high off the ground, full of presents for her for my Twitter followers who not only did I never meet, but I will never meet, ever. Why? Because I've been writing content that they've been consuming for the past seven years every day, and I never asked for anything in return. 
Now, a few months ago, I went to Tech TechCrunch Disrupt for the company that I'm working with, Zula. We were, we were notified two weeks before that they were going to TechCrunch Disrupt. You guys all know TechCrunch Disrupt? Familiar? TechCrunch Disrupt is, I, yeah, I would say it's the biggest tech event of the year. It's run by TechCrunch. And, you know, the judges on stage are Zuckerberg and Marissa Mayer, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, the winners, generally speaking, end up getting bought. It, it makes companies, basically. We were told two weeks in advance that we're going to this conference. The companies that we were competing against, and I'll tell you how it works in a second, had been preparing their pitch for TechCrunch Disrupt for a year. They had 10, 15, $20,000 of marketing budget to win. The way it works is there's Battlefield, which is a stage. Like I said, Marissa Mayer, Mark Zuckerberg are the judges. You have a pitch, you stand up your pitch, and there's one winner, you get a big prize, big cup, a lot of Israeli companies have won, Saluta, have won, Shaker, whatever. Killing each other, that one slot. It's insane. I mean, they're pulling out all the tricks. It's insane. We literally had zero budget. We came there with our app, on an iPhone and an iPad. Me and the founders, we sat there at a desk, and we demoed it. Yeah, so nice. And everyone else was giving out swag, and glasses, and t-shirts, and that crazy stuff, and they had costumes, and it was like a Broadway show, and we're sitting there demoing our app. Turns out, at the end of the day, Mike Butcher from TechCrunch comes over, he says, okay, you guys won. I said, what now? He said, yeah, you guys won. Turns out, little did I know, how does that one startup get selected? The TechCrunch writers select them. Guess whose blog the TechCrunch writers read every single day for the past seven years? So what, are they gonna choose some startup they don't know? No, they choose Hillel, because he's a good friend of ours. So we won. When we got off stage, again, the results were, I mean, literally, speaking of Microsoft, they, you know, right away, boom, Microsoft Ventures invested along with many, many other startups, many other uh, VCs. It, it basically launched the company. By the way, at that point, we didn't even have an app in the App Store. We weren't even officially, we didn't even have a product. But that is the ROI. Meaning, you can talk about yourself all day long, and you'll get whatever you'll get. Some conversions, you know, some clicks, some impressions, whatever it is. Or you can provide value. The more value you provide, and that value, by the way, can be in many, many forms. I'm a big believer in content. I'm a big believer in, and I enjoy it, so I do it. Writing. How often do you write? There are no rules to this stuff. But I fundamentally believe, and I've written many, many articles about this, that every single person in this room, and every single person I would say the Western world, I don't know about planet Earth, should have a blog. And it is fundamentally broken that to network today in 2014, you're giving me a card. Does that make any sense to anyone? You are summed up, you're summed up in this little thing? No. You wanna know who I am? Open my blog. You'll read my voice. You'll, read, you'll know who I am. You'll read my content. That's value. That builds relationships much more than a silly little card, right? It's, Everyone's thinking about how to craft the whole business card solution of networking. You know, oh, I have an app to do. How about you just write content? And then the person gets to know you, and that's the end of the story. I think that, you know, content should be an absolute foundation of this whole thing called social. Everything else is a nice layer to have, but writing unique content as often as you can. Every single startup, every single company, in my humble opinion, it's absurd to me that there are companies out there that do not have a blog. And it's even more absurd to me that there are companies out there that have a blog and talk about themselves all day long. It just doesn't work. You know, I don't know, again, if you guys have heard of Buffer, but here Buffer, you guys are like, you have to check out Buffer. They're, they're a Twitter app, it's irrelevant what their product is. They have tens of millions of fans and followers around the world. These guys embrace the, the whole transparency thing. They're like uber transparent. They, give, they like publish their CEO's salary. They're like a little bit nuts, but they write amazing, amazing content. Not about themselves, and not even about the Twitter ecosystem, which is their space in which they play. They're writing amazing, kind of life hacker. Uh, you know, like, just good advice for life. You know, how to sleep better, things. And they have insane traffic. 100% converts into users, 100%. Does it happen overnight? Absolutely not. Now, I've been doing this for blogging for six, seven years, and my dad, and my brothers, and everyone around me is like, for many years, what are you, are you insane? Are you a, a fryer? That was the question I got 30 times a day. What are you writing all day, not making any money? You're meeting startups every day. I'll tell you about that in a second. You're meeting startups every day, closing rounds. They closed 50, 50 rounds of finances over the last whatever amount of years. Never took anything from anyone. I'm helping startups with intros, you know, the press. No, never. Everyone for years, literally. What are you a fryer? Not that word, man. But I said, listen, I'm thinking of something bigger, right? I'm not thinking of taking 50 shekel from a startup who was sitting with me, you know, over lunch, giving some advice. I'm thinking of something bigger. You know, at the end of the day. If you're, 
you know, if, you, if you're building a, a name, a brand, whether it's for your company or for yourself, and, I, and that's another question that, that's worth discussing, you know, how do you differentiate? You know, when you write a blog of a company, do you write I, do you write we? When you're tweeting on behalf of a company, is it I, is it we? In other words, people don't talk to companies, right? You talk to a person. So it has to be personal. That's another discussion worth having, but, but when it, let's, let's drill down a little bit. There are many, many, many platforms, as you all know. Uh, you know, on Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, Google+, LinkedIn, it's endless, right? It can't be everywhere. Uh, the important thing that, again, in my humble opinion, before any of those things, don't even think about those things. Write content every day, no matter what. You wake up in the morning, you get to the office, it could be a cute video with 100 words. It could be a 2,000 word analytical post about your space and the trends and where the market's going. That's fine. One of the two, it doesn't have to be the same thing every day, but it's, the point is, I need to know that I have a way to emotionally connect with your brand. If I have a, a way to emotionally connect with your brand, you just turn me into something that's much, much greater than just a, an impression. Now, if any of you follow me anywhere, you know that I'm a big, very big believer, and I might just knock you off your chairs right now. I've been on Twitter for six or so years. I have 25,000 followers, and I tweet like a, like a, like a madman. And Shabbat, my hands shake. Like, completely nuts. I overshare completely, again, if any of you follow me, I apologize for all the noise. Um, you know, Facebook, I'm very, very active. Been there, again, six, seven years. Google Plus, I've been there for two years. I have more than double the amount of followers. Last week, I shared a, oh. thank you. Uh, last, week, last week, I shared a, um, <laughs> um, last week, I shared a picture on, uh, on Twitter. Not a tech issue at all. It was a picture of uh, LeBron James and Michael Jordan meeting for the first time when, they, when uh, LeBron James was in high school. It's a cool picture. I tweeted it, I got 30, 40 retweets, something like that. Put it on Facebook, I got a few comments, it was nice. I put it on Google Plus, 2,500 shares. True story, happy to send you the link if you want. It happens to me once a month. Last, uh, last week I, I, uh, I, was, I was talking to a company and, I asked them, and they asked me if I had any, any way to get them access to the Google Plus API, right? You know, Google Plus didn't release an API. They're, they're, they're learning from others' mistakes. And the Twitter released their API and they should shut it down. And so they're saying, we're gonna keep our API ourselves and once we do it right, we'll, we'll release our API. But we're giving that to some people. So a company that I'm working with asked me, I really, you know, we really want access to the Google Plus API. Any way you can, is that worth a try? I, put, I, I opened Google Plus on my iPhone and I, I wrote a private meeting, tagged Vic from Dacho, the senior VP engineer at Google, the head of Google Plus. I tagged him and I said, Vic, any way I can get access Within 30 seconds, I kid you not, I'm happy to show you the timestamp. 30 seconds later, he tags his colleague who's in charge of giving out the API, boom, 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 done deal. 30 seconds. That kind of engagement, you will not find anywhere else. Now I know, Google Plus, it's a, it's a ghost town, right? That's where you're all thinking, what's this, what's this guy smoking? He's crazy, he's not Google Plus. There's, there's two, really two options here, okay? And we're gonna talk about the other platforms in a second, but there's really two options when it comes to Google Plus. You can either fight Google, because Google's, not, Google's putting all their eggs in one basket, right? If you want SEO, you need to be on Google+. Plus. If you want to review an Android app, you need to be on Google+. Plus. If you want to write a YouTube comment, you need to be on Google+. Plus. Okay, so you could say, screw Google+, Plus. Google's down, I don't have time for that stuff. Or you can embrace it, because again, the numbers are there. These are facts, and again, happy for anybody to come over, I'll open my iPhone right now, I'll show you the numbers. Today, I put a picture on Facebook, Twitter, and Google, I got triple the amount of engagement on Google+. Plus. So you can ignore that and fight Google, or you can embrace it. I'll tell you even more than that. Many, many people believe, you know, I hear this all the time. They're forcing us to be on Google Plus, well, YouTube and, and Android. Leave me alone, I don't, I don't wanna be on Google Plus, I wanna be on Facebook. And that's a legitimate you know, comment, I, that's completely fine. You don't wanna be on Google Plus and Google's forcing you? No problem, you're more than welcome to leave the Google ecosystem and there's this thing called Hotmail. You're all welcome to it. But the reality is, Google as a company is providing industry leading uh, products, they're doing it for free. And Google Plus is not a standalone, and this isn't just a marketing place, this, isn't, this, is a, this is a reality. Google Plus isn't a Facebook competitor. Google Plus is a unifying layer on, on top of all of Google's portfolio products. Like I said, Android, all those things are integrated in Google Plus. So, you know, you're ignoring something that's there, first of all, again, for, for nothing else than SEO. Everybody needs SEO, right? Even if you don't believe in Google Plus. You, do you understand Google Plus your world means your Google Plus content shows up above the organic search results. You can be on top of Google, Google by being active on Google Plus. That alone is worth your time. But put we that search, as, But we search with Bing. Say what? <laughs> <laughs> we search with Bing here. 
I forgot it's the microphone. All right, so I was in I'm not going there. I don't let that one fly, but uh, <laughs> you might be something for Listen, honestly, no jokes aside now, it's, it's, it's refreshing to see this, you know, giant Microsoft doing a thing like this, honestly. Really. Um, to Google Plus, it's a secret lesson, because, because everyone in this room thinks I'm, I'm smoking something, right? You all think that. I'm not aware of it. It's okay, you can tell me what it Right. I'm going to share if you want. No, but really, I mean, the bottom line is, most people think that, and, and you can use that to your advantage, because there's less noise there, right? Everybody's on Facebook. My feed is like, help me God, right? I'm not even going to talk about Twitter. It's insane, right? I, I, I'm off Twitter for three hours, you know, working out, you can't catch up. There's no way. Google Plus is quality, quality content. Now, there's ways to, 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 to rise above even the noise in Google Plus, right? It's a very visual platform, right? Pictures go a long way. As Twitter, it's textual based. They're trying everything to get pictures into your feet. It's not working, right? If you have a picture and you share it on Twitter and you share it on Google Plus, again, assuming you invest time in Google Plus, you know, just open it and you're going to get engagement. Here, here's a big misconception about the state called social media. People think it's like a magic solution, right? You don't open Google Plus and start getting millions of followers, you, millions of followers, millions of, it doesn't work like that. Like anything in life, the more you invest, the more you'll get out of it. But if you invest in it, like I have for years, the ROI is stupendous. It's way, way more than other platforms. Let's talk about Facebook for one second. Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg. Facebook is, in my opinion, fundamentally flawed as a marketing platform. Okay, now let me, Repeat that. Fundamentally flawed as a marketing platform. As an advertising platform, it is pretty much unparalleled. If anybody here has a mobile app, they know that Facebook drives more downloads than pretty much anyone else. Advertising, put that aside. I'm talking about marketing now. Think about a Facebook page. Think about how flawed this is. How many people here have seen, please like my page? Come on, seriously, really? Everyone here sees you like my page. Do me a favor. Every, I've seen it, I see it every day. And I, I, just, I don't know. I don't even know whether to laugh or cry. A guy writes on his Facebook page, "Please like my page." Who are you talking to? The people that already like your page. You ever hear the expression "preaching to the choir"? The only person that sees that message, you posting on your Facebook page, "Please like my page," is the people are the people that already like your page. Now, the only way anyone else is going to see that is if someone says, "Okay, I'm going to share that please like my page" post to my friends. Yeah, no one's doing that, buddy. That's not share worthy. So you're not getting any more traffic. Now, I can name endless, endless, endless examples of companies that either bought likes or <coughs> whatever they did, and they have hundreds of thousands of likes on their page, and they love to tell investors, and then you go into their post, one comment. <laughs> That's great. That's just really great. Great job. You know, like it's there's no again in my experience, and I'm sure that there are exceptions, but there are exceptions to every rule. There is no correlation between the amount of likes you have on a Facebook page and the amount of engagement that you get. And I will show you endless examples of that. There are exceptions, like Zag.com. You know Zag, they make um, invisible shields for the iPhone? Amazing company, whatever, they make iPhone accessories. But like, I, like Buffer and like many other companies, they believe in providing value. And so they do that. They do it on Facebook, they do it on Facebook. They have endless followers and endless engagement because they're, they're doing really good marketing. The amount of effort they have to put into it compared to other platforms is way, way, way more. In, in my opinion, I wouldn't, as a startup, as an entrepreneur, if I have limited resources, not if, when I have limited resources, we all have limited resources, you know, you have to choose, you can't be everywhere. Twitter, Google Plus, and blog is, in my opinion, the fundamentals. Uh, Twitter, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's so many stories, I don't need to tell you, a guy, you know, Hudson lands on the, uh, plane lands on the Hudson, a guy's inv invited, uh, called to, to be on the rescue team, he takes out his iPhone, takes a picture of it, he tweets that picture. That picture has 90 million views, listen carefully, before CNN knew about the plane crash. How does that happen? Because Twitter is so fundamentally viral, so fundamental, and you don't have to be, and I know what you're thinking, yeah, you have to be, you know, side, go viral. Simply not true. There are many, many examples um, of even Israeli companies that I, I personally, you know, there's a company, you ever hear of Giant Pizza? Anybody hear of Giant Pizza? They have, here's, here's That's the social media for Giant Pizza. They have, they have uh, pizza stores all around Israel, and they have a pizza store in Modi, and they make giant pizzas. And they design them, whatever. So they made a pizza for my kid with Angry Birds on it. Out of vegetable, right? The vegetables drew out an Angry Bird. And he took a picture of me holding the pizza, and I tweeted it. 
thing went. And, and when I say viral, I don't care about the, the amount of views it got on TwitPic. Is their phone did not stop ringing for months and months. How long? A long time. Very long time. For one tweet, for one stupid picture. It went crazy psycho viral. One picture. This is the cool picture, period. That's it. Not because I said please retweet or I, or I wrote someone privately. You know, if you look at my DM inbox, that yeah, means direct message for those who are not on Twitter. It's like it, basically emails, private messages on Twitter. Now everything's public, you can send someone a private message. For them, for you to send someone a private message, they need to follow you. My DM inbox is filled with, please retweet my tweet, of people that have 300,000 followers, and I have 20,000. How does that happen? Why are they asking me to retweet their stuff? The reason is because they use some kind of software, some kind of bot, to build up those numbers so they can tell their investors or whatever they do with that. Whereas I spent seven years providing content on a daily basis, so anybody that follows me on Twitter, click follow. So when I tweet something, I'll instantly get 65, 75, 85% CTR click through rate on my tweets, I mean, right? On the other hand, if you, if you look at my tweets, 90% of them minimum, and I, I don't like, you know, I, I haven't checked the statistic and whatever, but if you open my Twitter at any given moment, there'll be a lot of Instagram pictures of food. And there'll be a lot of replies to people. Very, very rarely, I would say if I had to quantify it, one out of every 10 tweets is me broadcasting. It's sharing a link. One out of every 50 tweets is me sharing my own content. If I shared the opposite ratio and all of it was my own content, pushing me and pushing me and pushing me, which is what most people unfortunately do on Twitter and social media, me, 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 it just wouldn't work. I wouldn't get the CTR, I wouldn't let people click through, I wouldn't get DMs from people who have 15 times more followers than be asking me to tweet their things. It just wouldn't happen. So the point is, as a startup, as an entrepreneur, your top priority after today is tomorrow morning you get to the office, you open up. What do you write about? Not yourself. What you write about is you take whatever industry you're in, which presumably you're passionate about, right? Otherwise, what are you doing? Otherwise, close up shop and go home. You have to be passionate about what you're doing, right? Everyone keeps asking, what's your business model? I get like, I go, I go crazy when I hear that question. And what was Instagram, Tumblr, uh, you know, WhatsApp? All the, all the winners, what was their business model? Business model was providing value and bring, bringing users in and keeping them in because it was an amazing experience, valuable, again, value and stickiness, right? Ways, all of them, there, none of them had very minimal revenue, ways of $14 million revenue, very little revenue, relative, again, and obviously the, the classic example now is WhatsApp. I mean, it's absurd. We can debate it all day long, what the hell is $19 billion? It's absurd, right? We can debate it. The answer is, and again, this is up for debate, why did Zuckerberg pay $19 million? Because people are obsessed with WhatsApp. It is their form of communication. Zuckerberg cannot afford for 450 million users to not be communicating on Facebook. And the same goes for Snapchat. He cannot afford for 450 million people to be sharing pictures on Snapchat every day. He can't afford that. So he offered Snapchat $3 billion. And he offered these buckies guys for $19 billion. Smart decision, not smart decision, we can discuss it. But that's the reality. So. What's my business model? If I have 450 million users reusing my platform every day, let's, let's not talk about business model. You want me to flick a switch on monetization? You need it, right? Have to monetize 450 million active users, really not very problematic. But I think it's a fundamentally flawed question. We're going off topic level, but, it, but it's, it's, it really does come to tie back down to the same thing. If you provide, whether you're in mobile or web, your goal should be providing value. And that's true about the product. The second, that's true about your social media strategy. Damn, I use that word again. It's true about everything you do in marketing. Provide value. Give me a reason to connect with your brand. Not to use your brand and to click buy. Because if I do that, if I see uh, a, um, a billboard for Pepsi or for Toshiba and I click buy, I convert. Tomorrow, Sony calls me and says, you bought that stereo for $99? I'll give it to you for 98 What do I do? The hell do I care? Go to Sony. Just take the dollar. I have no emotional connection to Toshiba. I don't give a crap, I don't, right? The answer is, if, if I was reading Toshiba's content every day, and I'm simplifying, obviously, right? But if I'm, if I'm emotionally connected to Toshiba, then I'm, yeah, I'm a lifelong customer for, again, overly simple, oversimplifying right now, but give me a reason to connect to your brand. So tomorrow, write a blog. What do you write about? Whatever industry you're in, this is your industry, widen your hands a bit, a little bit. Not like this, right? So if I'm in mobile advertising, this is mobile advertising, I don't want to write about tech. I'm not going to be a tech crunch competitor, but maybe mobile. There's a lot of competitors. Okay, so there's a lot of competitors. This company, Bob, that I told you about three years ago, three years later at 750,000 readers. Not only 750,000 readers, but if you go look at this company's Twitter account, 
All their competitors, and again, this is a company Petrotecha, all their competitors, AdMob, AdMeld, companies like Millennial Media, billion dollar IPOs owned by Google, there's not one company in the entire landscape that has even close to half as many Twitter followers as this company has. Not even close. The blog explodes, every single industry lead, every single industry player in mobile advertising knows this company. Why? When we go to MWC, literally, it's the next booth are our competitors, and there's a line around the block, talk, wait, stop, to this company, not to them. Why is that? Because people connect it through content. So you take your niche, widen your hands a bit. Not like this, a little bit. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable, it's, it's difficult for a CEO to say, write about trends, and I'm gonna pay you. It's difficult. But when the ROI comes, it comes pouring in. And it's way, way bigger. Way bigger than traditional uh, marketing. Yeah. Would you ask your opinion about LinkedIn? How do you use LinkedIn? <coughs> That's a good question. Um, depends what your goals are. What are your goals? Uh, we are a B2B SaaS company providing something for uh, uh, for developers. So we want the awareness. And so I think after Google Plus, uh, the biggest secret weapon, in my humble opinion, is LinkedIn. Not not for the reason that all of you use it, but there's something on LinkedIn which I'm sure many of you use called groups. Groups are super targeted. So when there's a group about pancakes, and you're in the pancake industry, you get your butt into that group and you share your content there. We don't share it like, look, I know, wrote a new blog, new blog post link, new blog every day, new blog post link, new no. There's a conversation about the topic. In fact, maybe even read the conversations and write based on that. That's a little bit out of the box. The point is, join the conversation. Share your value. The traffic you'll see from LinkedIn is not only quantity-wise, blows everything out of the water, but the quality, the time on page that you're gonna see from Twitter is great. Google Plus, great. LinkedIn, through the roof. Because there's these, these my grandmother's not in that group, the people that are in that group clicking on that link are people that are interested in the topic you're writing about. Uh, a few years ago when Instagram came out, no one had heard of Instagram. Instagram did the same thing that 50 other apps before it did. It's systematic, people please, they all did photo sharing, right? No one had heard of Instagram. I tried Instagram and I loved it. Why did I love it? There were certain things about the, the execution, certain things about the user experience that were just superior. For example, any Instagram users here? You ever notice that when you apply a filter and you hit send, Split second, it's already uploaded. Split second. Any of the competitors takes four seconds, three seconds. It's the difference between three seconds and one second. It turns out, and I researched it a bit afterwards, that Instagram actually does a little trick here. When you start applying those filters, they take the elements of the picture, and I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm not a coder, but something, this is the, the concept. They take the elements of the picture that they can upload, and they start uploading in the background. The second you hit upload, it's boom, it's, in, it's, it's up. It's in the cloud, or on Facebook, or wherever you, wherever you posted it. I wrote, I wrote an article called um, Five Things Instagram Got Right to Others Before It Could. I believe that was the title. If I had met with an SEO consultant that day, and I would have said, I'm about to write an article about Instagram, he would have said to me, what are you smoking? No search volume, no one heard of Instagram, you'll get zero traffic, don't waste your time. That's what he would have told me, because there was no search volume, because no one heard of Instagram. But I was truly passionate about it, and I wanted to provide value. I don't care if no one heard about it. I wanted to write this, and I, I truly fundamentally believed in what I was writing about. And I was passionate, so I wrote it. Fast forward a year. Instagram slowly but surely, you know, starting to go a little viral. Who's top of Google on the word Instagram? Yours truly. Getting traffic, a year old. The post is a year old, getting traffic, like I can't even imagine. One year later. Fast forward two, three years, and all of a sudden it's through the, the day Zuckerberg bought Instagram for a billion dollars, the search volume on that word was something I've never seen before. And I got, I think it was, 150,000 views within a few hours on a post that was four years old. That would never have happened had I sat with an SEO and measured and quantified what I was about to do. But I didn't. I said, I'm going to provide value. I'm going to write something that I'm truly passionate about. And that's what I did. And, and the results were through the roof. It's really about providing value. And that's true about all kinds of marketing, by the way. And if you think about it, what you're trying to do is, when you're answering, answering someone on Twitter, you're saying, you know, wear a blue shirt in the morning. What you're doing is you're getting on their radar, right? Mark Andreessen from Andreessen Horowitz, right? I guess one can say he's the biggest VC, he's the dream of every startup to get an Andreessen uh, Horowitz uh, investment. The guy's using Twitter like a, like a monster. He's tweeting 80 times, 90 times a day, whatever it is. You know, now, am I gonna, am I gonna get an investment because I tweeted Mark Andreessen? Clearly, obviously not, right? I'm not 
delusional. Having said that, it's one thing to go into, and, and you all know this, right? It's one thing to go into a VC or any, anybody else, a cold call, a cold pitch to a blogger, whatever it is. It's another thing to say, oh, I, I know you, I know you. Whether it's through an introduction, whether it's through Twitter. This, these things happen, I mean, it's a reality. It, it sounds funny, but when you're on their radar, you're on their radar. Now, again, you can get on their radar by saying, hey Mark, check out my platform, it's the greatest. Good luck with that. He probably gets 150 tweets like that a day, you can be sure he ignores all of them. But for example, Many, many times he debates those very the Bitcoin. So he debates the topic a lot. Get in a conversation with him. This is obviously just one example, right? The point is, you, you, anybody you want to reach in your business, anybody is on Twitter. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. Anybody's there, yeah? I'm a, I'm a fan of an Israeli startup with global aspirations. Uh, where would be my best? Aren't we all? Yeah. So what would, and, I, and I still, my English is not that good. So what would be my best uh, investment? Work on an Israeli blog in Hebrew? No. Or in English, even though it's absolutely not the same. You want to, you're going, I had this debate today, by the way, literally today, I kid you not. With the company that I work with, let's write about our industry. You know, it's very, very easy to fall into that trap. Your goal with this blog is to get as many eyeballs as possible on your web property. Not, let me be very clear here, not only your target audience, but in your case, your target audience is global, so there's no question that you, what are you, you going to accomplish by writing in Hebrew? Gonna at best get some local, right? No question, and I don't even care if your English isn't good. If you, if you won't do it, someone in your company should do it. And, and honestly, let me tell you a story. A few months ago, I was, I was mentoring a, a startup at the uh, launch pad at Google. This is a true story, I, I almost fell off my chair, but it's an unbelievable story. Young startup, pre-launch, three women I was sitting with, and I said, okay, I asked the first question, I always ask, okay, my tough keeps them a call, right? Well, who are you, what do you do? Hi, I'm the CEO, great. Hi, I'm a social media listener. Hi, I'm a social media broadcaster. <laughs> Kid you not. They have a full-time employee for listening. They have a full-time employee for broadcasting. Kid you not. That's a little bit nuts. A little bit. But in reality, this thing is tremendously powerful. This thing, I mean, the web in general, but especially the social web. Tremendously powerful listening platform. In terms of blogging, you can reach anyone. Anyone. And, and you know, just one thing that I decided many, many years ago. I said, you know, like I said, it's all about relationships and providing value. So I write content. One of the things I said is, you know what? I did a little psychological, you know, mind game. I said, people actually, no matter who you are, it doesn't matter how famous you are, everyone likes to be on a stage. Everyone likes to, you know, be talked about whatever it is, right? <coughs> I said, I'm start interviewing people. And I aim very, very high. I said, I want to start interviewing rock stars, really important people. I said, you know, Twitter, I can do it, right? So I interviewed Alyssa Milano. Talk she already follows me, so we're good friends. My wife wasn't very happy. On New Year's Eve, she wrote, she wrote me a DM and said, Happy New Year, sweetie. My wife was like, But if you think about it, I'm, I'm in Big Shemesh, right? I grew up on Who's the Boss. I mean, what? It's absurd. You think it's absurd, but, but it's a reality, right? So I interviewed a list in the line. I interviewed Dennis Crowley, Foursquare, founder of Foursquare. I interviewed uh, Mike McHugh, Robert Scoble, Guy Kawasaki, um, uh, Mike Elgin, um, writers of TechCrunch, writers of Flashlight. <coughs> I don't know, 30, 40 interviews that I've done, I've done over years, and I'm trying to over, you know, all the time do more interviews. And these are these are connections that have helped me endless times afterwards. These are relationships that I had in place, you know, that I would never, forget to never be able to accomplish. I would never be able to dream. You, you know who Guy Kawasaki is? Yeah. I mean, the guy's like a legend, right? He's a legend. He's, I would say, single handedly responsible for making Apple cool. <coughs> he, was, he was Apple's first evangelist. His job was make Apple cool. That's his job. So he did. I mean, Apple's pretty cool products too, but. but the point is, I mean, how would I ever fathom a million years connecting with a guy like that? I tweeted him and I was like, God, can I interview you? Sure. I sent him an email, boom, done. It's, it's, it's mind boggling, right? But it's a reality. You cannot afford, this, this, there's no other way around it. You cannot afford as an entrepreneur to not be producing content, to not be providing value. And again, it doesn't have to be a blog. I do blogging because I enjoy blogging. Make a YouTube channel, make good videos. To interview people, whatever you want, provide, give me a reason to connect with you, not self-promotion. It just doesn't work. Yeah. So second question. Yeah. You mentioned that you didn't answer. Should it be a personal blog or a startup blog? So, so this is debatable. This is debatable. Um, the important thing is, even if it's, one second, should it be a, the blog should be a company blog. The question is how you write on that company yeah. blog. And that's, that's debatable. I mean, for every one person that will say this, someone else will say that. The important thing, though, is whether you write we or I, that's less important, that's semantics. But the important thing is that this blog has a personal tone. When I read it, I enjoy reading it. It flows. 
you know, if I'm reading it and I'm like, didn't do anything. If I'm reading, I'm like, this, this is really interesting. And I click bookmark and I come back the next day and there's more content. You just, you just acquired me, again, it's more than just a customer. It's much, much bigger than a conversion. That only happens through value. And if you do it as often as you can, by the way, what does TechCrunch do that I don't do? Why does Mash have like 50 million monthly, I think monthly, 50 million monthly users last time I checked? I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm off the number, but, but what do they do that I don't do? Simple, simple answer, value, that's it. That's it, do they write better than me? Absolutely not, I'll show you my email, I send them typos every day. Typos up the wazoo. What do they do? They write endless amounts of content. 50, 70, 80 articles a day, they're just producing content, that's all. So yes, you can write once a week. If you write once a week, you'll get X amount of, con of, of traffic. You write once a day, you'll get X times seven. Twice a day, etc., etc. So I understand there's a limited, there's limited resources. So I'm not gonna tell you to full-time blog, I mean, you got other things to do, right? But absolutely, it's completely, it's not, it's not a luxury anymore. You need to stand out. And you, and, and you know what, the, the reality is, some people are already got this. This is no longer a secret, the majority haven't. So you really are in a good time right now. Just take the lead on this. Literally, go into your office tomorrow, open wordpress.com, start a blog. Forget the design, choose your, your subject. Again, have something you're passionate about. Not something you think is gonna get more traffic. That won't work, right? Just the same way it won't work for you to Build the startup thinking that you'll have an exit. It doesn't work. An exit's great, but you build something that you're passionate about because you want to make the world a better place. Mark Andreessen said last week in a blog post, this is a true story, I'm happy to send you the link. If you go into his office the first meeting and you say, this is my startup and this is how I'm gonna monetize it, kicks you the hell out of his office. True story. If you come into his office and one way or another present to him that you're gonna change the world and make a better place, and money does not come up in the conversation. True, it's a true story, he wrote an article about this. It does not come up in the first conversation. Eventually, some return needs to be discussed, right? But the point is, if you provide value with your product to the world, you'll be able to monetize it. You will. And you know what? David Karp of Tumblr, after Yahoo bought them, is not a co-founder. One of the first employees was a co-founder. I need to make the best experience, and I need to provide value, and I need to do it consistently. And there's your two words. Value, consistency. As often as you can, and as much value as you can possibly provide. That value is up to you to choose the format and the vehicle at which you provide that, but provide content consistently, and you will stand up and you will brand yourself, and yes, you will convert and monetize. Thank you. Two words. Uh, uh, how do you overcome the problem of uh, writing? Uh, somebody who is talented with writing, and if you want to write on something very technical, these are. It's a hard match to find somebody. If you're not talented, you need to write about something technical. How do you do it, you're asking? Yes, I, my, par my partners are the technical guys. They can write about the... the Hire a blogger. What? Hire a blogger. So he is, doesn't understand anything about databases or... So you, so, you know, I started my career as a technical writer at Converse. What does that mean? I would sit with the SME, subject matter expert, and I would say to him, all right, tell me about this $200,000 SMS system. And the guy would talk to me in a third English, a third Hebrew, a third Russian. I had no idea what he was talking about, right? But I had to then write, write documentation. I had to write the, you know, the, the user guide. So I had to understand it. So yeah, let, let him sit with your VP, R&D, whatever, whoever, and let him, you know what? What did Albert Einstein say? You can't explain it to a three-year-old or then you don't understand it yourself. It's a, it's a good task for your VP to be able to, to verbalize and explain what he's doing. But if you can't, there's a problem. And again, it doesn't have to be in blogging language, the bloggers should be able to take that and simplify. That's what technical writers do and that's what bloggers do. They take things, I, I literally often send my blog post to my mother, I swear. I say, can you understand this? And if she says no, I'm doing something wrong. Honestly. Yeah. What's the best stage to start blogging about the product, about the product? Never. Never. The question was, when should you start blogging about yourself? When should you start blogging about yourself? Never. Your own product? Never. Never. <laughs> Don't write about yourself. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? I'm 100, I don't know why you guys are laughing. I'm dead serious. If you write content, uh, by the way, look, I'm not, guys, I'm not delusional, okay? At the end of every blog post, have sign up now, on top of the blog, have sign up now, link to the homepage of your site. Give them a reason to convert. Give them a way to convert. But the blog is content for me to connect. Not for me to, to be sold. Never write about yourself. If you have an announcement, and 200,000 readers in your blog, clearly you make the announcement on your blog. That's all I'm saying. 
But blog content is not about yourself at all. It's about establishing yourself, your brand, as a thought leader in your space. You are, want to be the Google of your space. Period. It. By the way, Google, I really have to end because I'm about to get killed. One more second. Google is a perfect example. Google does things that make zero sense from a business perspective. In fact, Google didn't know how to monetize for years until Yossi Vardy monetized. You know that. Yossi Vardy came up with a business model for Google, by the way. You familiar with this? True story. Kid you not. They had no idea how to monetize their search. They said we're making the best search, search engine possible. I don't know how to monetize. Until Yossi Vardy came up with the whole AdSense, one third, two third. That was his. True story, documented by Sergey Brin. True story. Google's a perfect example. I sat, I sat with Yossi Matias, director here. The guy's doing things that make zero sense. He's funding projects, Dead Sea Scrolls, and bringing in female uh, young girls into high schools to teach them that they can be engineers. Why? I said to him, I literally asked him, I was like, what is in it for you? He said, dude, Google's business model is making the world a better place. Period. You mean it. We're not playing games. Never write about yourself. Establish your brand as a leader in your space. Become an authority. It will convert. Up the wazoo. It takes time. Build it. Long time. If you build it, they will come. You know the movie? Really, that's what it's about. What do you do? That's what I'm asking. What do you do? Anyway, uh, blogging is kind of the way you're describing You can talk to your ass in Hebrew if you want, by the way. The way you're describing it is kind of how, uh, which is different from my core business. So, can you compare between uh, doing it in house and outsourcing? In house. Yeah, in my humble opinion, there are people that will tell you otherwise. Because again, there's limited resources. But in my opinion, it's an art. It's an art. Really. Not every else. business, not an especially startup, has resources. Has resources and, and maybe an access to. to access? Like somebody. Listen, you're in this business. My inbox is filled with 80. I swear, I, kid you, I will show you my inbox. I have 80 CVs in my inbox of people that will blog your butts off for you. You need someone? Let me know. <laughs> I'm not 100% serious. There are many people who do this very, very well. Problem is, people, like many of you, just don't get it yet. So they're not, I'm a blogger, how do I need you for, right? There are many people that do it. So yeah, you, you're not, you need someone who is part of your DNA. You can hire an outsourcing. You won't get the job done like you have someone in your DNA who's telling your story, the way, no, growing up no. with your company. The source is not the guy who writes it. The source is the, the, the outcome, the experience of right. the, the, the awareness you acquired in six or seven years. Right. This is the source. If I start doing it, I'm just in the beginning. But your your product, the awareness you acquired during those years, this is it, the resource. This is your resource. Is there a question? I'm trying to figure out the question. I'm saying that I would rather go to somebody like you who created, who already created this awareness so hire for these no. six or seven years, rather than uh, uh, hiring somebody in my company. So hire someone in your company who's done it. Sir, why, why is that? When they hired me, this company that I was talking about, three, I, I already have it. Why not? Money? You give up on something, it's more important than other things. Like, really, it's more important than other things that you might think are fundamental. Seriously, sometimes you know, companies have QA and data analysts. It's more important to have a voice. Nice. Two ways. <laughs> 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 <laughs>